is a huge Ricky Fallon. Good morning. James is a huge Ricky Fowler fan, if you were wondering what I was telling Michael. Uh, <laughs> how's everybody doing this morning? Good. Welcome to CWC. We are so glad to have you. If you are new with us today, we would love for you to fill out a Connect card. You can get one of those at the welcome desk or there's people floating around with them. Fill that out. Let us know who you are so we can get you information about what's going on around the church. Also, we have a small gift for you. If you are wondering what's going around the church and maybe you're not so new and you do not know, we have an app. Uh, download our app. It's uh, fancy and free and all those things on all of the Google stores and Apple stores. And we try our best to make sure that we have pertinent info up there for you. Uh, so if you're wondering what's going on, it's a great way to find out. Hey, a couple of quick announcements. We are, in, we are getting to the end of the church here for the Wesleyan Church. So we are going to have a night of worship next week. So April 21st, we're going to have a night of worship right here in the sanctuary starting at 630. You're going to want to make sure to be here for that. It's going to be really good. We're going to talk about some goals and vision for the next year for our church, uh, spiritually and all that kind of stuff. And then the following week, April 28th, we're going to have our local conference if you didn't get excited about the worship night, get excited about local conference. There will be reports, there will be financials, and there will be voting. Thank you. Thank you. That's what I, that's what I needed. That's what I needed. So for real, if you're a member, we'd love to have you come out and express uh, your opinions and voice and vote and all that kind of stuff. So make sure to be there. Our youth, they're going to have a quick meeting after the church down at the uh, end of the hall here to the left. But also they're going to have open gym before uh, the local conference. So April 28th, open gym from 2 to 5. So if you want to shoot some ball or whatever, come on out. Hey. Let's all stand together. Let's uh, open our worship this morning by reciting the Apostles' Creed together. This is a creed that we've been saying as a church for a very, very long time. It's a creed that unifies us, not only with other believers across the world, but also believers who have been before us and who will come after us. This is a beautiful thing for us to express and to be a part of. Let's read together. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. And in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. And he shall come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit the universal church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Amen. Let's sing together this morning. Who am I that the highest king would wear?
Psalm 4, 8 says, In peace I will lie down and sleep, for you alone, Lord, make me dwell in safety. Lord, we're so grateful for your protection over us today, God.
you want to attend a church where the Spirit is moving, the Spirit is here. All you have to do is just let the Spirit move. So as you go through the rest of this service, I just pray that you will pray, Spirit, move among us. Show me what it is you have for me today. At this time, we're going to go into a time of giving of our tithes and offerings. There are ways on the screen that you can do this. There are baskets here at the front. There's a box at the back. Also at this time, we'd just like for you to move around for a minute and just greet one another. Tell someone you're glad to see them in church this morning. Also, the kids are going to be gathering right over here to get ready to go downstairs. So during this gathering time, they can start making their way over here. Thank you. If we could all find our way back to our seats, we'll stay staying. We'll sing the chorus to What a Beautiful Dame a couple times. together. Father, we come before you, the one with the beautiful, powerful name, 
the one who moves among us, who changes our lives. Father, we pray that you will open our hearts and our minds this morning. Fill us with your Holy Spirit. Transform us from the inside out. Father, I pray for those who are in this room. Prepare us to receive your word today. For those who are unable to be with us today, draw near to them. Help us to be able to, help them to be able to feel your love and your mercy and your power in this moment, even outside of these walls. Father, I pray that you will be with us as we uh, use these tithes and offering that we have given today to further your kingdom. Help us to use them wisely. Father, we love you and we lift you up. Amen. Amen. You guys can be seated. So I don't know uh, if there are any fellow, well, I'm just going to call it what it is, nerdy people out there. Um, I love the eclipse. Um, You know, the crazy thing about eclipses is we know when they're coming, but they're still like this kind of crazy thing, right? Yeah, I mean, like we, we have like calculations and stuff to know, like the next one's going to be in 2028. And if you're on this path, you'll be able to see it. But still, like there's all this like mystical fervor around it. Um, I remember the first one in 2017. Uh, or not the first one, the last one that I was a part of uh, in 2017. And uh, I was in Alabama at the time. I was actually at work uh, during the eclipse and um, walked out. I had bought my glass. No, actually, Katie's mom had given me glasses uh, to watch it. And I walked outside and I looked up and uh, it was crazy to see the moon pass in front of the sun. We didn't have totality in Alabama, but we had a pretty good amount. And um, it was crazy because of how, like, dim it got. And um, Katie's family is from South Carolina, so they had a lot more uh, of the totality than we did. And Katie's mom got me this picture from Charleston where they had all of it, uh, where they painted this portrait where all the streetlights came on in the middle of the day. How cool, how cool. And then this year... We got to see, I think it was 80% uh, coverage. And what was wild is I remember, uh, or not remember, I walked over from the office to go to the girls. I did not prepare enough, so we had no glasses. Uh, But I did make a pinhole camera. I whipped out my fifth grade science skills and made a pinhole camera. Um, And we all got to watch it in that way. But what was crazy is it was like 80-ish percent this time here. You know, if you had not known there was an eclipse happening, you would just think there was some cloud cover. Right? Yeah. Kind of crazy. But when you look through the pinhole camera, you can see the sun, the little dot. And you can see the moon moving in front of the sun. Yet when you take your pinhole camera down or your glasses off, I mean, it was kind of dim, but it was more just like overcast, right? Was anybody else disappointed? Because I'm not going to lie to you, I was disappointed. Yeah. The sun and light have a way of doing that. They win. (laughs) Every single time, they win. Uh, No matter how much you think is going to happen, and if you're in the path of totality, which... I saw pictures of that. It was still not nighttime. And you could still see the sun around it. The, the, the solar flares, and you could see that little ribbon around it. I forget the, forget the spacey term for it. But you could still see it. The sun is that powerful. Light is that powerful, right? Yeah. So today's text, we're going to be in 1 John for the next few weeks, Um, and we're going to read through it together and work on it. Uh, I'm going to challenge you. It's it's going to be a three-week series. It's going to be a super short one because all of John's letters you can read in about 20 minutes. So I would encourage you, read 1 John, 2 John, and 3 John. They are really good, and um, I would just recommend, as we're in this series, just take some time to read it. But let's start. We're going to read 1 John 1. 1 through um, verse 5 to start off with. It says, That which was from the beginning, 
which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at and our hands have touched. This we proclaim concerning the word of life. The life appeared. We have seen it and testify to it. <clears throat> and we proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and has appeared to us. We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard so that you also may have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We write this to make our joy complete. 1 John and 2 John and 3 John, I don't feel like get the love that they deserve. You know this about me if you've been around for a little while. The Gospel of John is my favorite gospel, just period. Like, I love it so much about it. Um, it's my favorite. And we're fairly certain that the same person wrote 1 and 2 and 3 John. The reason we think that is 1 John is actually an anonymous letter. We're not sure... Uh, technically speaking, they don't want you to know who wrote that. But the other two are from the elder. And we know that the Gospel of John was written by someone with the same moniker. So we are almost certain that it's the same author. Now, the John, the Gospel, and the letters from John here are also written in a very similar style. And they use a lot of the same imagery. So it just makes sense that tradition says that John wrote these. And let me just tell you, academically, it just makes sense that John wrote these. So we feel pretty certain that John wrote these letters. And we're also fairly certain that John, from the time he wrote his gospel to now, has taken on a lot more responsibility in the church. He's now over several churches which is where this letter comes into play. We're almost certain that the churches he's writing to here are in Ephesus. And let me just tell you, trouble has been brewing in this church. Some have left, some are angry. And some of those that left have quit acknowledging that Christ is the Messiah. And now they're coming back to try to pick off some of the people who stayed. Trouble is brewing. One of the reasons I love John's gospel, and John, honestly, so much, is because he was so bold as to call himself the one who Jesus loved. Let me just tell you, among friends, which the disciples would have been friends, among friends, this is the guy you're like, dude, come on in. The one Jesus loved. He loved all of us. But mine is in the gospel and all of the world from now on will know that I was the favorite and that Jesus loved me. Not all you suckas. Right? This is John. And I love the confidence. I love how it just spills over from him to know and to so boldly put in his gospel. I'm just going to say it. Jesus loved me more than y'all. So... But what's funny, even more, is when you go through these letters, the one who Jesus loved, or the one that Jesus loved, has turned that love back to the people in his responsibility. John wasn't just loved, he loved these people. As you read these letters, he calls them his children. He's talking about how he's going to come to them and help them. Jesus' love for John had so transformed his life that now the people that he's responsible for are receiving that same type of love from him. You see, Jesus' love is not just like when your mom loves you and you know that like your mom's proud of you. I'm just going to be honest with you. My mom hung this picture up that I painted one time. She should not have. It was not good. But she hung it, and she's proud of it. You know who would not hang that picture? Any of you. <laughs> you would say thank you and quietly throw it away. And that's okay, because it wasn't that good. But Jesus loves you the same way that my mom loves me. 
And that love transforms you. And when you allow that love to transform you, all the people that come under your care get to be the beneficiaries of that love. Now, John opens his gospel with saying, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He's talking about Jesus there. He's saying that Jesus is how we know who God is because the only way you know me is how I speak to you. You don't necessarily know me just from looking at me. How I treat you and how I talk and all those things are how you know me. And how we know God is through Jesus. So now he opens his letter to them to remind them subtly that the word that he received in Christ is the word that he is now giving to them. And the word, if they hear it and take it in the same way that he did, they are a part of that fellowship. And I love this word. There have just been books written about this word that he uses is koinonia. It's a Greek word and it's a good one. But it's more than just like casual friends. It's a deep abiding relationship. It's a fellowship. It's more than just we let this guy hang around. You are on equal footing when you accept this word. He loves them. Without the love of Christ, he could never feel about these people the way he does. I hope you know that. Because, let me just tell you, I've had to manage some stuff in my lifetime. Small stuff, nothing major, but I've had to manage some stuff. The natural bent of the human heart is not to feel this way about people who don't listen to you. Right? It's okay. We can all be honest here. We're in church. When people don't listen to you and you're supposed to be in charge of them, it makes you angry. Okay? That's normal. You're not weird. As a matter of fact, I'll give a small example. When someone does something I specifically tell them not to do and it backfires, I never go... I just love you and I'm so glad that you're a part of this and we'll learn and we'll, we'll fix this together. Not once have those words naturally left my lips. What normally leaves in my mind and I want to say is, I told you so. Thank you. <laughs> I heard that amen up there. <laughs> but John, because the love of Christ has infected him so much and transformed his very way of living life, lovingly responds to these people and says, listen, we're going to be okay. And we're going to right this ship. I invite you today to listen to these words as we move now to the further part and remember that love. And know that John, while he's talking to the people of Ephesus and the churches that he's responsible for, is in the same token still calling and inviting you to that fellowship. So we're going to go to verse 5 and we're going to actually go through verse, uh, chapter 2, verse 2. So it says, this is the message we have heard from him and declare to you. God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar and his word is not in us. My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But if anybody does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, 
Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. God is light, and in him there is no darkness. I I love the image that he shifts to here, because John, when he writes, he doesn't give you this, like, logical progression of an argument, which is what you're supposed to do if you're writing a good paper. You basically have like four or five points and like you defend your thesis. His thesis is God is loving, so you would then work around that thesis building it. John doesn't do that because he's probably smarter than all of us. He actually uses like this circular argument where he like, he has a central point, which is God is love, and then he works around it over and over and over and over, right? Right? I'm telling you, if you haven't read it, that's what's happening. So (laughs) one of his first images he works on is God is light. And this is not a new image for John. It's an image that he had before. It's an image that works throughout the text in the Bible itself. It is an image that is tried and true and beautiful and magnificent in all that we need to hear. And I think with the eclipse being this week, it just should remind you that God is is the light. What I love about the eclipse and the reporting of the eclipse is you're supposed to be in totality if you really want to enjoy it. And they basically say to you, if you're at 99%, it's not as good. If you're not at 100, it's not as good. Because that 1% of sunlight ruins the whole thing, right? Because light defeats darkness every single time. If there is light, there is not darkness. You cannot measure how dark something is, but only how much light there is in something. God is the same. His light is now in this world. And because his light is in this world, the darkness is in retreat. Because the darkness is in retreat, there is nothing that's going to happen but more and more light to come. Because darkness cannot exist in the light. And what that means in not like a metaphorical sense is that the brokenness and chaos and hurt that is in our world that is caused by sin, which is the broken relationship between us and God, is now in retreat. It has been defeated. Just like even though the sun passes in front of the moon and there are parts of our world that are in darkness for just a split second, it can't last. The moon is not enough to keep the light out. It's coming around the edges. It can only hold it off for just a second before the light breaks back in. God's love for you and for this world is no different. You may look around and think that things are bad or that, you know, there was this real big contingent of like the eclipse is coming so they're more the end of the world is nigh. Heads up guys, the end of the world is always nigh, but that's a whole different thing. The light always wins. Always. God always wins. No matter how much brokenness is in your life, the moment you allow God to inject his light into your life, the darkness flees. How do we do that? What does that mean? How do we work through this? Well, it's simple. God, through Christ, forgives our sins. So first and foremost, you have to know that the sin that is in your life is only temporary. The second thing is, he says, when we confess, to confess your sins. You can't just go about your life pretending like nothing has happened, that you've never messed up, because you make God a liar. Have you ever met someone who can't admit that they're wrong? It is infuriating, right? It's like, dude, we all see it. And we're all human, so we all know you screw up. It's okay. But they're out there. (laughs) 
And what John is saying is, if you are not mature enough or old enough or self-aware enough to realize sometimes you screw up, then you are trying to say that God is a liar. That he came and died and took all these wounds for just for fun. Don't make God a liar. Or don't try to make God a liar. God's not a liar. You sin. (laughs) So, Confess your sins. I think as a church, we struggle with the idea of confessing our sins. Especially beyond internally. We're good evangelicals. For those who don't know what that means, it's like we don't, like we're not Catholic. We don't go to the, the, I can't remember what, you called it something the other day and it was hilarious. The box or something. I don't remember. She was talking about a confessional booth and she called it something and it was hilarious. And um, so anyway, so we don't do that. We, you know, we are grownups. We confess our sins in our mind where nobody can hear them and we don't ever have to deal with it again, right? Yeah, come on now. We love that. It's a great part of being an evangelical is you don't have to say what you did wrong out loud. That's a lie. (laughs) Because that's not all of confession. It's part of it. Part of confessing is confessing to God in our prayers. But the next part is to confess to those that we've wronged. And say, hey, I'm sorry. And man, that's hard, right? But I love what C.S. Lewis says. Continuing to play On that dark and light metaphor, C.S. Lewis says, Once you confess with your mouth, the light of Christ eats those sins and they no longer exist. There is so much freedom and power in confessing your sins. Confessing to the people that you have wronged. Confessing to our Savior who is waiting to forgive you because he loves you. There is so much power in realizing that. Because you turn loose that purifying light that is our God. He is looking to overcome and eat up the darkness of our world. He only needs you to confess and realize where it is in your life. We must become better at confessing. We must. If we don't, sin will reign. If we don't pull that stuff out of our lives and expose it to the love and light of our Savior, He can't take it. I mean, naturally, it's terrifying to confess your sin, right? Yes. What if they find out how terrible of a person I really am? I have this thought a lot. If you only knew, I was telling the guys this morning how much of a procrastinator I am. I am an active procrastinator too. I will do other things so I don't have to do the thing I don't want to do. One of my friends, and this is not a story for me, but it was hilarious. So I've always kept it in my back pocket. But one of my friends, whenever they're cleaning, this is his wife picking on him. She says, whenever we go to clean the house, he always like, I got to organize this file cabinet right now. So the house is literal chaos and he's in there redoing his filing cabinet, right? Why? His filing cabinet probably needed to be redone. Like, let's be honest. But let's worry about the big issues before we worry about the file cabinet, right? Let's, Let's get the floor vacuumed before we start being concerned with the papers that are out of order. This is how pretty much all of us operate, in my opinion. Not necessarily with that specific scenario, but when it comes down to confessing sin and working through where God wants to work on us, we pick the most irrelevant parts of our life because we don't want God to touch those ones that we think are important. We want God to work on us in the way of like, I'm not good enough at reading my Bible. When he's sitting there saying, you have an anger problem. Let's talk about that. (laughs) Or you have a problem with deceiving people. 
let's talk about that. And you're like, you know what? If I could just, if I could really just get myself motivated to wake up at 5 a.m., I would be a whole lot better of a person. And God is like, no, let's talk about the anger and deceit. (laughs) But we don't like to admit those things. Because those are hard. And those say more about us as far as our character and who we are at our core than how early we wake up or how disciplined we are. I'm just going to tell you guys, discipline is hard. It's always been hard. It never will not be hard. Discipline is hard. But self-discipline with those big issues like that is even harder. Anybody can force themselves to read. I promise you, anybody can. It's a lot harder to force yourself to be a calming, peaceful presence. To be a presence of light in a dark world. That's so much harder. But here we are. John tells us right out of the gate, not only can you do that, It is literally your call to be that. Because when Christ came, when the word came and he shared fellowship with his disciples, it was with the intent that they would then become the word to the people that they become friends with in their circles. And then those people would become the word to people outside of those circles. And it would just be this cascading, multiplying effort of the word of God going through us, making us all a fellowship together and sharing the word with our world but it only happens when we confess our sins it only happens when we allow God to be that permeating light into the darkness of our own lives so that he can then turn us into the light that pierces the darkness of this world that's hard right yeah John's gospel is a hard gospel. It's a gospel of love. It's a gospel of change. It's a gospel that reveals the character of our God to us. John's letters are hard because they reflect how a community permeated with that love should function. It should function as brothers and sisters, as children and parents. And that's hard because let me just tell you, even with your real brothers and sisters and children and parents, those relationships are hard. It's hard to hold love with people who are human, who are not automatons, who do exactly what you want them to do. It's hard to love someone who is independent and has free will just like you. It's hard. But it's still the call. It's still the call for you to love them and also to realize that maybe, just maybe, there is some stuff you need to confess too. But that's the call. And people are going to leave and they're going to be mad. I'm just going to tell you it's going to happen. Do you know why people leave and get mad? Because they didn't do anything wrong. Right? They're perfect. It's okay. It happens to every church. It happens to every family. It happens to every person. Now what I would encourage you, I would implore you to know that you are not perfect. To know that sometimes you have to check your will your desires, your pursuits, so that you don't become the person who Paul, who John is going to describe as an antichrist. He talks about not only, we, we have this weird image, like there's only going to be one antichrist. John's very clear that there are a lot of antichrists and they're all over the place all the time. 
The Antichrist, by John's definition, is anyone who is trying to attack the body of Christ. And you try to attack the body of Christ by not living as God has called us to live and by trying to pull others away. And a lot of times that happens because you pretend like you're perfect and you set this standard of this is what perfect looks like. When we all know you're not perfect, I'm not perfect, I fail constantly. So please look at my God because he is the only one who is perfect. He is the only one who has not failed us. But people are going to leave. People are not going to want to hear this because it's hard. It's hard to live this way. But when you do, it's beautiful. It's peaceful. Because all of the responsibility, all of the pressure to be perfect comes off of you. You just have the pressure of being honest when you mess up to confess. You have the, the purpose of going to God and to others and confessing, hey, I've screwed up. But the peace and the love that you get for that are so worth it. Let God be God and you be his. Let's all stand. I love candy. It makes you feel good. I love steak. It makes you feel good. That fat in the steak, you know? Yeah. Candy doesn't really provide much for you, though. I'm going to be honest. It just tastes good. And that's about it. Like, if you eat it, you're, like, hungry, like, ten minutes later. Pretending to be perfect is the same way. Like, it feels good in the moment because, like, you win the moment. Like, if you don't admit you're wrong and somebody's like, dude, whatever, and they walk away. Like, you've won the moment. But that stacking effect of constantly having to be perfect and constantly never confessing that you are not perfect will absolutely destroy you and every relationship you have. Steak, on the other hand, is delicious. It's harder to cook a steak. It's more expensive. It takes a little more time to eat. You know, I can destroy an entire bag of fun-sized Snickers in 10 minutes. Steak takes a little time. You have to marinate it. You have to let it rest after you cook it. You have to cook it at the right temperature or else, like, it's terrible. But it nourishes you. Like, it's actually good for you. Like, the protein and all of those things that it has, it's good for you. Things that are good for you take a little time. They take a little more sacrifice. They take a lot more. Don't accept the cheap pleasure of perfection by the world standards for the true joy that God brings in resting in his perfect plan for you. Confess your sins to God and to those that you sinned against. That is peace and health. It's hard, but it's beautiful. Let's pray together. Father, we come before you and we confess as a church we have not met the mark. Father, we love you and we thank you that you are by the side of our Father advocating for us in love. We thank you that when we confess that we have missed the mark, that you are there bringing us forward in love and in mercy and in grace, filling in our failures with your love. Lord, help us to commit to your love. Help us to commit to your grace. Help us to realize that you 
are the only perfect love in our world and in our universe. And that you are giving us that perfect love. Lord, help us as we have relationships with others and with, within this church and within our families and within our workplaces. Help us to be that presence, that forgiving, loving, grace-filled presence in those areas so that we can bring your light into this world. That no darkness, no thing can overcome your light and your beauty and your grace that only you are the light of our world and that you have broken in and are changing this world. Father, we love you and we thank you. Amen. This week, I want you to do something. I want you to make a habit of confessing. Make a habit of confessing in your prayer. Make a habit of confessing when you're wrong. It's, if you're not in that practice, it's like super scary. But it's okay. You'll make it. God made it. And he's telling you, if you'll follow me, I will protect you. So confess. Let me give you guys a blessing today. May God the Father, His Son, and the Holy Spirit bless you and keep you. May He give you the strength to live the life that He has called you to and that you will feel the peace of His forgiving love. Amen. Amen. Go in peace.